One of my favorite uh, sea run cutthroat flies to fish with is a uh, little orange, I mean, tiny little orange polar shrimp. So, yeah, I, I do. I convert these flies down to, you know, because, I mean, it's what I like to tie. And so that feeds the passion just as much as the fish do. So I think it's just cool to be able to connect with fish on a pattern that you really like. That was Joel Hill talking about the crossover between steelhead and coastal cutthroat flies. Back to our bread and butter with a buttery smooth fly tire today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the show. We've always got a great giveaway going on on the podcast. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway to check out which product we got on there right now. Today's episode is presented by Deddy Flies, established in 1928, is the oldest family-run fly shop in the country, now in their 94th year. Deddy's mission has always been to supply the fly fishing community with the finest products and services. Every fly they sell is tied in-house by a hand of select domestic tires. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Deddy to grab those flies right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash Deddy, D-E-T-T-E, to support this podcast and the oldest fly shop in the country. Joel Hill is on the show today to dig into some steelhead fly patterns and tips. Joel shares some of these tips on marrying wings, how to get your proportions just right, and some of his favorite flies that work great for uh, for sea run and for steelhead fishing. Another Instagram fly tying phenom. So without further ado, here is Joel Hill. How's it going, Joel? Pretty awesome. Pretty good, man. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for doing this today. You know, I, I know you've got a busy schedule, so I'm glad you could set some time aside here to dig into a little bit on, I think we're going to talk about steelhead flies and tying. You've got the uh, a pretty sweet Instagram, you know, uh, well, not a channel, but you got a, your Instagram uh, profile over there is pretty amazing with all the flies. Um, and we're going to dig into that. Uh, but start us off first, take us back to a little bit on the, the, the fly fishing and fly tying. How did you initially get into the fishing? Yeah, well, um, fly fishing started with my grandpa, probably when I was about five, he used to take me up, uh, into the mountains and we would, uh, fish for cutthroat trout up in the mountains and, uh, little creeks and stuff like that. And I just remember having a whole bunch of fun doing that. Now, when I, you know, of course got into my teenage years, uh, girls and cars kind of took over. <laughs> so I, I mean, it kind of had a falling out, but, um, about 10 years ago, you know, I've got two kids and we moved to pretty close to a lake. We got lake access and, uh, started, uh, taking the kids down to fish for, you know, red eye rock bass and, and bluegill and stuff like that. And they were having a lot of fun. So that kind of reignited it. And, mm-hmm. Um, next thing you know, I'm down at Sportsman's Warehouse buying a, a new vice and a whole bunch of materials. And, man, I just kind of fell back in love with it again. So There you go. And then I found Steelhead. Yeah. <laughs> and that was just a whole new wormhole for me to dive down. So, Yep. And the Steelhead flies, you've kind of doubled down on that's kind of where you're, you know, the stuff you've seen, what you have out there is pretty amazing. What, how did you go from getting started in fly tying to what was the jump to tying what looks like, you know, some of the best kind of clean flies out there? How long did that take you to get to that level? Uh, I mean, you know, it happens pretty quick nowadays with Instagram and, you know, there's so many people out there helping everybody. Uh, and I ask a lot of questions, um, you know, people reached out to people like Jason Miller and, and bugged the hell out of him. I've been back like serious, like really tying flies again, about four or five years, eh, maybe a little, I don't know. I don't remember, but about five years, I think. Closer to four years, five years than, than 20 years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you know, my grandpa bought me my first vice and taught me how to tie woolly buggers and, you know, stuff like that. So that's what I did when I was a little kid. But I mean, like I said, it didn't stick. 
So you mentioned Jason Miller, and I'll put a link out to Jason's episode. We had him on, and uh, I remember seeing him at the show a while back before COVID. Uh, we did like a two-hour segment on one of his flies. But uh, you do something with um, like a YouTube thing. Are you still doing that with Jason, where you guys like go live? Or maybe it's on Instagram. How are you doing that? Yeah, it's on Instagram. I, we haven't done that in a while. Um, you know, kind of life gets in the way. And it was just, it's really a way for us to hang out together. Um, you know, he lives in Bend. I live in in Tacoma, Washington. So, I mean, oh, okay. there's, there's a big, uh, span of, you know, we just, we just don't get together very often. So that was our way to hang out. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, and are those, uh, are those still out there anywhere? Could people, is that like on a, uh, a reel or something somewhere? Yeah, I think, uh, on his, uh, Instagram page, I, I think there's videos there. Same on mine as, as well. I've got some up on mine buried in there with all of the fly pictures, I guess. So, Okay. All right. We'll put it there. And we're talking about topics, the tube flies. Yeah. I, I'm seeing a few out here. You know, you have a lot of flies that are kind of traditional um, hook style, but you've been, uh, I don't know, transitioning or, or talk about that because I know a lot of people start tying one way and then, and then tubes might come up later. How did that start for you? And what's the difference between like tubes and tying just normal flies? Sure. So, um, you know, most of the flies that I like to tie are more traditional and they're a little longer and slender and they look really good on really long hooks but unfortunately pinch a barb on a really long hook and you have lots of leverage for that fish when you do encounter one and chances are you're going to lose the fish and that happens a lot um so kind of the idea behind that and i mean it's not my idea i've seen other people do it too but certainly uh translating those patterns onto a tube which allows for a a short shank hook you know to kind of trail back behind um just gives me kind of the ability to tie the style of flies that i like to tie and have them fish well too and and be able to hopefully uh i you know i haven't had that actually happen yet with with the tube flies but uh, hopefully be able to hook up and land one so Exactly. Yeah, because that's a different, a little bit difference, right? The tube fly is. It, do you feel like it's easier to tie on a tube since they're a little bit uh, fatter in diameter? I don't actually, and that that could be just because I'm so used to the hooks. I mean, it is pretty new for me, but uh, I actually have had a lot of problems with body veiling. So, like some of them, like uh, my, one of my favorite flies to tie is the is the Moonlight D. Uh, it's an old D pattern. Um, and it's supposed to have, well, it's supposed to be Katinga, but, uh, I, I use, you know, um, uh, Asian Kingfisher for, for body veilings on the rear half. And they're supposed to stand straight up and on that big round flat or round surface, it's really hard to squeeze those feathers to the tube and have them stay straight up. So, I mean, they end All up right. laying down, but, uh. I mean, that's not a huge deal breaker, but I mean, just little challenges like that and just trying to get used to that kind of stuff. So that's right. That's right. Well, I'm looking at a couple fly and I'll, is the moonlight, I'm sure the moonlight you have it somewhere in your Instagram feed somewhere there. Uh, the tube one I just tied recently, it's got white wings. It's probably, Oh yeah, I see it. It's blue and yeah, blue and red in the butt end. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Okay. Yeah. And it's got the split. So that's the D right. The split wings is makes it kind of that. That's the D style. Yeah, so strip wing D style flies, they got the, you know, most of them have a, a V kind of shape to them, and you can have them, you know, sitting horizontally, which is what I typically do, or have them sitting vertically, which gives you, you know, a, a bigger up and down profile versus if you lay them horizontal, they have a, a flatter, you know, you see it a little bit differently when when it's in the water swimming that way, so. Right, right, exactly. And actually, I think I'm looking at this one. This is probably a different one. This is from January 16th. The, it says, Deck Hogan Skagit Mist variation. Oh, yeah, 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 Skagit Mist. Yeah, there's. I think it was really close to that one. It's a black and blue yeah. kind of thing. Okay. Let's dig into the Skagit Mist, because I think this one looks cool, too. A deck was on a, a long time ago, or quite a while ago, and I'm not sure if we talked about that, but... So that pattern is your stand. So that is a standard D pattern as well, right? It's got the two wings that are kind of tied a little bit more vertically. Yeah. So I mean, uh, Deck, us- I think his is basically a a variation of the Acroid, which is a D pattern. 
and uh, it's a great pattern. Uh, the Ackroyd is, you know, yellow rear half and black front half. Uh, Dex is red in the back with with black in the front uh, with a white wing. So yeah, I mean, it's one of those iconic steelhead patterns that that's been around for a long time. I just love tying those. So yeah. So I'm looking at this, and let's just stick it with Dex Fly because this is cool. It's a, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, the ribs and uh, you know the butt. You got a little purple. I, just let's let's start with the tail. Let's just go to the back. So I think is that golden. Well, you got a couple things there. Right? It looks like it's golden pheasant crest, right? You got a couple. Let, let's talk about that really quick. Tying that tail. In. Any secrets there when you tie that in so it sits upright? And and when you're tying all this stuff, is it just a matter of you make a wrap? It's not quite right. You adjust it, or, or give us a tip there. How do you make all this stuff look so good? All right. Yeah. Um, a lot of patience and a lot of luck sometimes, honestly. (laughs) Um, but there is, you know, proportions are pretty important on these flies if you want them to look right. So finding an actual tail or a crest feather that fits the actual fly that you're going to tie, uh, is a big one. And then on the crest feathers, having one that's, you know, I don't like to tie it in real close to the tip. There's a little white section close to the you know the other end yeah the other end of it and if you peel some of those fibers back leave them on the shaft of the feather and cut them close to that that kind of gives it a little bit more grip to to help uh, help get it to stay where you want it to so yeah do you always do that when you're cutting when you're placing hackles or feathers or anything like that are you always trimming it leaving little barbels i guess cutting it short to grip if i on tails on, for crests, absolutely. I typically just, you know, if I'm tying in a hackle by the tip, I will just uh, tie it in, fold the tip back, and then tie over that, and then cut that off. That kind of just makes sure that it doesn't come out. You know, it's got to oh, break. Right. It's got to break. It won't. It won't pull out. It won't pull out exactly. Okay. All right. Cool. And I'm I'm looking down through some more. You got a lot of. I mean, there's definitely a mix of. Well, let's talk about that. We had this recently on an episode, uh, or I guess a little while back, um, you know, the feather wing. We were talking about that, like tying it in and stuff like that. It looks like you have an equal amount of feather wings along with the more of the uh, the wings that are um, married and stuff like that. What, what is the more common wing? What is the most common? So when you think of spay flies and D flies, which is pretty much what you tie. I mean, you tie traditional stuff as well, right? Very rarely. Okay. It's mostly spay and D. Yeah. Like the full dress flies. Um you know, I dabble in it a Dabbled. little bit here and there, but it's not something that I really focus on. Yeah. So most of your stuff is the Spay and D. And I'm looking at one. This one is actually really cool. For some reason, the blue stuff is sticking out. This is from um, December 18th, 2021. And this is tied on kind of a traditional hook. I guess this is the Snow Queen variation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, I believe that's a Joe Howell pattern. And it's kind of, a, it's a modern, you know, Spay style. Mm-hmm. I'm actually looking at it right here. I'm supposed to send this to a buddy. Will that fly? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. you go. I haven't been able to get to the mailbox, so I was gonna, and then the holidays got here. But yeah, it's red crest feather for a tail, uh, silver tag underneath that. It's supposed to have white ostrich for like a little butt section, but I used just some white under fur that I had because I don't have any white ostrich right now. And then a uh, blue silk body with silver ribs and then a white spay hackle. This one happens to be a uh, white ear pheasant. Blue guinea collar, mm-hmm. white goose slips for the wings, and then some jungle cock cheeks. And jungle cock. So on those wings and the married wings, is that whenever you're doing there, those, how long do those take? Like on this one, is that a pretty long process to put that married wing together? Married wings, no, not, I mean, yeah, when you're marrying different colors and stuff like that, it takes, you know, it's, it's not hard, it's just time consuming, but. Yeah, and this one is, so this one, married wing is, I mean, talk about the married wing, why, why the married wing, why not the, uh, do you know a little bit of the history there, why not do the um, the other wing, right, what, what are the wings, talk about that, Spay and D's, what, what are the wing types? So you can have a married wing, um, where you're just marrying fibers, from different types of feathers, uh, where it's, you know, so you can get different colors and you can mix it in there. I think the advantage to marrying feathers together is you're, you're in control of where the colors are, right? So if you have kind of a color scheme that you want it to, to look that a certain way, I mean, it's obviously going to 
change once you start fishing it a little bit, but you know, it'll for the most part stay where you want it to be. They're a little stiffer. They don't move as much in the water um, unless you you know brush them out or cast like I do, and then they they go all over the place. But do they stay stable when you cast that thing over time? And is that what's that wing look like at the end of the day? I mean, it'll it'll start to look brushed out. I mean, some of it is just maybe uh, different materials too, right? So goose and stuff doesn't stay married together as well as uh, say turkey tail turkey tail if you tie it in because it's, it's pretty thick stuff if you tie it in and it compresses really good it stays together when you compress it it's pretty hard to keep to get those to unmarry so i mean and then the uh, other ones i guess uh, would be hackle tips that's more of like a glasso and pacific okay. northwest space you know space style i like you know and then there's mixed wings where you're not really trying to keep them married. It's just kind of a bunch of uh, stuff just put on top of the hook. And those fish a lot better, I think. And eventually, you know, a married wing will end up like a, a mixed wing would. So, Gotcha. So those are kind of the three standard, that's it. Or, or the, the D, the D style, the broken up wings, right? Yeah, the just the V shape wings. And those are typically, you know, long and either turkey or something a little stiffer than than say most of these little you know goose and goose shoulders is typically what i use for you know married wings that have different colors because i have a whole bunch of different colors and goose so okay so I'm, I'm moving down here well actually right next to it this is like the uh the week before this is a good little gold um I mean, this is just a little muddler, right? It's a size eight. This was on December 18th, 2021. Uh, is that your standard um, kind of dry fly? That's your standard muddler, steelhead muddler type fly? Yeah, um, I love muddlers, especially for trout. I haven't really fished a whole lot of them for steelhead. Mm-hmm. I just kind of think it's more of a surface fly. And I, I mean, around me, I don't really have any summer run steelhead to really fish them for. Yeah. I'm pretty much always fishing for winter fish, which, you know, typically I'm trying to get down deep. So, yeah, yeah, gotcha. So that's trout. So you're looking at a basically, and how, and you're just like, you'd be, how are you fishing that, that little muddler? I'll swing it and skate it. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. So you're skating them for trout and I mean, just like you would be for steelhead. Yep. That's a cool, I mean, definitely the muddler is a great pattern. Is Do you think that that fly we're looking at here where it's, it's fairly sparse, is that pretty uh, standard? you know, for the muddler and, and the hook too is also pretty good. What type of hook are you using there? I think that's a fire hole hook. Those are pretty cool hooks. I I have a hard time figuring out what else to tie on those other than muddlers. So hmm. anytime those come out, I always just tie a muddler on them. Yeah. Cause they're kind of long, right? They're kind of a, well, it's not long shank, but it's kind of a, yeah, it's a unique hook, isn't it? Yeah. It's got like a big, a big bend, pretty wide bend. Um, okay. And they are razor sharp. Those those are seriously wicked little hooks. Nice. So what would be your, if you were going for summer steelhead, uh, what would be the fly you would be you'd be choosing, your, your one fly? Probably a purple muddler, uh, honestly. Oh, Roy, really? purple muddler. Yep, purple muddler, anything, I don't, I don't know, I like anything little purple. purple hair wings, yep. Gotcha. I'm just scrolling down here, I've got a couple more. you got a purple, uh, what is this one? This one's... Uh, uh, the Hurlwing GP idea. So this is kind of a... Oh, yeah. Yeah, this was this was in November. So how do you get... So when you're tying here, talk about that. So it looks like... I mean, how often are you posting on Instagram a new fly? Recently, I haven't really been. Things have kind of gotten a little busier at work. And um, just got back from fishing five days out on the coast in Oregon. So, uh-huh. so I haven't really been posting a whole lot. But typically, I'm, you know... Tying is my, my therapy. <laughs> it, yeah. it, uh, keeps me connected when I can't go fishing. So I just come home, tie a fly and makes everything better. Exactly. So you're posting, I mean, it looks like almost every day if you, when you have time. Yes. Okay. All right. Perfect. And I'm scrolling down. You got one. This is a good, so this one looks, I like this one. This one's a little black, uh, yellow tail. This is Ben's black prince. Yeah. So that's a classic steelhead fly. That is, yeah. So that's from September 9th, uh, 2021. So so that is classic. That's not, um, but is that a spade deep style or is just, would you just say that's classic? 
Yeah, so I think traditionally um, Ben's Black Prince. Is that what it was? Yeah. Black Prince? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, I think it's typically, um, I think it was a hair wing, but it, I'm not very good at hair wings. So I oh, typically really? just use goose and kind of give it my own kind of shape that I like with the with those type of wings. So I try to stick close to the pattern, but, you know, change it up here and there just to be a little different. And a quick word from our sponsor. Lake Lady Rods builds distinctive custom rods, each created one at a time to the exact specification for each angler. Custom built to be the most sensitive tool a discriminating angler could ask for, Lake Lady only uses the highest quality products and components. I can definitely attest to this with their unique rods. Uh, Chris built me a rod and this thing is definitely the most clean and unique rod you'll see. From the custom Portuguese cork handle to the gunmetal reel seat, this unique rod package is super clean and awesome. Don't want to forget the jungle cock inlays that highlight this rod. It's super nice. Lake Lady also restores and builds custom bamboo rods from scratch as well. And I am glad to connect you with Lake Lady right now and their passion and promise. You will get the most unique rod you have seen this year. Check out Lake Lady Rods at wetflyswing.com slash Lake Lady. That's L-A-K-E-L-A-D-Y. You support this podcast by clicking over through that link right now to Chris. Okay, back to the show. So you don't like the hair. I mean, do you tie, could we see anything with the hair wing on your feed? Yeah, there's some, uh, there's a few in there. If you scroll down, probably somewhere in. Well, why is the hair wing so much more? Because it seems like what you're tying there is challenging. Why is the hair wing so much more challenging? Um, it's hard to get a small head with hair. And maybe it's because I use too much hair. And like, yep. I don't know, I'm not, maybe not as good as it, as I could be. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's just challenging. Um, I've, I've tied a few and fished them for a little while and came back and didn't have a wing at all. Um, that's always depressing. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Yeah. But sometimes that's the great thing about fishing. Sometimes you get the wing ripped off. It's still working just as good. A little slim profile, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. So, and this is a yellow tail. It's got, um, and then what's that? Is that a gold? Uh, what's the, uh, under, uh, the gold, uh, rib or it's not rib, but the gold, uh, the tag. It's just a gold metal tinsel. Yeah, yeah, it's just got a little bit uh, corrugated around. It looks cool. It's it's not your flat silver. It's yeah, embossed or semi embossed. Yeah. So that's pretty standard. So you got that. You got your tag. So pretty much all these flies, you know, you have your tag, your tail, and then you got your little. Is that ostrich? Yeah, ostrich. Uh, I guess they call that the butt right after the tail. Yeah, the butt. Yeah. What does that do? Do you think all these things, when you look at this pattern, like this one or any of your ones that are way more uh, detailed, do you think every piece on that pattern has a reason for it on top of just looking cool? Do you think there's a fishing reason for it? I don't know that there's a fishing reason for it. Um, and this is just purely speculation. When you tie in a couple things as a tail, you start to build up bulk. And if you want to hide that bulk, you put a butt on it. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly, I can't think of a, a fishing reason to have a little black strip of ostrich right there. It looks cool. That's yeah. it. Yeah. It looks cool. Yeah. That's good. So, okay. So that's your standard black, which is always, you know, you mentioned purple black is also a, a great color. Yeah. And yeah, you, you have a good mix. So I see another muddler in here. I see some, uh, I see an old, uh, skunk standard. You even have some old, so this is like really traditional, right? This is your chenille skunk that's pretty cool so you mix yeah, up a little bit i do and i think i actually may have used ostrich on that oh really yeah yeah i don't really have any chenille so i either dub body um or use ostrich as you know as my body gotcha okay well what, what do you think when you were talking about steel tying flies um you know when you guys are doing those videos when you're tying i know you're just kind of talking and doing stuff i mean if somebody's learning or you're trying to teach somebody some things about some tips. Are there a few things that you think about when you're telling them how to get into it? Or do you just say, hey, watch this video and learn how to tie the fly and you'll pick up a couple tips? Um, I typically, you know, if people ask me questions, I answer them. Um, I'm typically not someone that is going to go up to, you know, and say, hey, you should do this or, you know, but uh, 
I think some of the tips that I like to hand out when people ask about these style of flies um, is proportions for sure. Um, proportions for me, you know, the fish probably don't care for the most part, but proportions make or break the fly, you know, making it look like it fits the hook. Um, it's just something that I've always liked to try to make it, you know, you don't want to have your wings way too long and it makes yeah. your hook look really small. Um, and again, it'll probably fish just fine, but <laughs> it's just a personal preference thing. And that's, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And I'm seeing, I'm, I'm scrolling down now and I'm seeing some stuff that's, this is pretty interesting because this is a, uh, this is from, yeah, January, I guess this is 2021, a year ago, um, Black King Spay with more traditional. I mean, this thing's got a crazy amount of, um, the Spay hackle on it is kind of all over. Talk about that a little bit. When are you tying, uh, when would you tie a kind of sparse Spay hackle around the body? And when do you have a big, kind of more of a bushier one like this? Yeah, so the the real sparse ones are typically I'm using blue ear pheasant dyed, or um, I do have some of the brown heron that you can get from Canadian tube fly. So those make a really sparse hackle, and those are great for getting down and you know really getting being uh, aware of that sink, getting the sink rate down. I think uh, the bigger profile flies with the uh, it would be just it's like rooster tail half bronze uh is rooster tail okay and i strip one side to keep it as sparse as i possibly can and then the amount of turns is you know when you go from the back to the front that's where you get that profile um the more wraps you put on it though the less it's going to sink it's kind of a give and take you know if you want a bigger profile it's not going to sink as as fast unless you're you know i have played around with weighting the bodies of hooks as well but oh, that's really? kind of a yeah that kind of gets to be a pain in the butt as well so <laughs> so yeah. I just, tubes man that's where i'm headed that's i think that's where i'm going especially you know nowadays with all of these more traditional hooks kind of going away um the mcneese hooks are my favorite oh, yeah. and they're they're not making them anymore yeah they're not making them anymore um i asked dave about that and uh he he's just got more stuff going on i think he's got a daughter he's trying to pay for going through college mm -hmm. and it's, it costs a lot of money to make those hooks it's a lot of money up front oh yeah so i i get that so yeah yeah well well let's jump into uh let's start this we got a little segment called coffee talk here and let's jump into this and i'm going to dig into some uh, questions from the facebook group uh sure but um, but starts off with the coffee talk. So tell us what what are you drinking typically in the morning? I'm not sure if you're drinking something now or what do you typically have in the morning? Coffee. <laughs> Is it coffee? coffee? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're a coffee guy. Okay, right yeah. on, right on. Good. So, yeah, absolutely. It, all right. So um, so we got the coffee. So l let's just bring this out. We got a question here. This is one from uh, from Jack, and he was asking, and I don't know if you have an answer for all these, but this is he was kind of questioning. Um, finding really long shank stainless hooks. And I don't know why, you know, again, why stainless, maybe he's tying, he might not be tying steelhead flies or whatever, but let's go to the hook thing. So where do you, so you just mentioned it, right? About, you know, these hooks go away. What do you do when your favorite hook goes away? What, how do you find out the, find that next one? I just start buying, you know, little batches of this or that, or what I think, uh, I mean, that's how I got on those, uh, fire hole hooks. One of my favorite hooks to tie on would be the, TMC uh, 400. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't remember. <laughs> but it's it's a little heavy down eye hook. Uh -huh. um, TMC 700. That's what it is. Okay, perfect, perfect. And Firehole's got a hook that is a really close match to that. Their Firehole 839 is a really awesome hook. Um, I, I just kind of you know buy some, but anymore i'm tired of looking for them they're expensive too when you find them so yeah i'm not going to make make these hooks so i just start tying tubes yeah start tying tubes exactly so yeah you're going to tubes and then what do you and then yeah off the back just whatever um there's plenty of hooks you can get to tie off the back of the tube right hang off the back yeah absolutely just a little short shank i like the uh what is the SC-15s, uh, like number two hooks? Those are really good hooks. And on that, back to stainless, uh, so are you tying any, ever tying any with stainless steel hooks at all? A little bit. Um, just 
just for sea run cuts. I mean, I live pretty mm -hmm. close to the sound here, so I mean, uh, occasionally I'll go um, look for sea run cutthroat, but uh, I don't tie a whole lot of those. So, okay. Uh, and let's go back to something you already mentioned, the proportions. So this is uh, Robert, uh, his question, he said, um, was just for a struggle, is proportions, proportions, proportions. Yes. That's a common thing you hear a lot about because people tend to, uh, they tend to put too much, right, especially starting out. Uh, when you're doing it, what, what, is the, what is that tip again? So how do you control, how do you know what the fly should look like and then how do you control proportions? One of the ways that I uh, kind of learned proportions was, looking in books and finding a hook that matches the at least size of of like a picture of the fly and kind of mapping out what you would use to make those proportions and even marking it on the hook itself before you go to tie and then yeah it's super easy to overdress these flies i mean mm -hmm. if you don't strip one side of the hackle i'm always thinking about how it's going to swim and sink and so, I mean, and then the other side of that too is, is like, I follow my, my tinsel ribs with the same amount of turns of hackle typically, at least for spay style flies. And so that's why I don't put a whole bunch of, um, ribs because that would mean I have a whole bunch more turns of hackle, which makes it not sink as well. So proportions, it's, uh, that's the key to that style of fly really. Yeah. What about, here's another one. I think this might be, I'm not sure if this is Robert as well, but they, um, we talked about the mud minnow working with deer hair. We've had some episodes on deer hair working with, but, but what would be a tip there? Are you pretty good at, uh, working with the deer hair? Is that a big challenge? I'm okay at spinning deer hair. Um, I, I typically will use, um, uh, like a gel spun thread, something slippery. Uh, if I'm going to spin some hair and something that's a little stronger, I typically am tying most of my flies with 70 denier or a dot mm -hmm. I, I really like uni thread but yeah when i spin deer hair i'm definitely using something a little bit thicker and slipperier it's messy though <laughs> that's why you see it's you know on my feed there's one or two muddlers here and there i don't do a whole lot of them it's just because i hate cleaning up the mess <laughs> oh right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so. Yeah, that's the mother. Okay, uh, and then your heads. You also mentioned this: the head. What, what's the what's the tip on creating that beautiful head that's not crowded and that looks perfect like you do? Yeah, um, that comes down to proportions too. Is uh, you know knowing when to stop your body so you're not getting up too close to the eye, and then I kind of taper my bodies from the tail. It's skinny gets a little bit fatter and then kind of as I get towards the front of the fly it's going to taper back down and I want it to get as small as possible uh, so when I'm starting to tie on the wing I'm basically tying on a bare hook um, I, I want as very little of, amount of thread wraps there as possible and that way I can put as many securing wraps as I possibly can to secure the the wing without making too much bulk right if you start off with a bunch of bulk underneath your wing it's going to get even bulkier so there you go and uh and we're just going down i've got a couple more here I, i'm curious so so i think yeah you mentioned you've already hit on a lot of this stuff the tying wet fly hackles sparsely and that um is that it is it stripping the hackle uh, one side is that the only way or how else would you make it even more sparse you can make it less sparse by um if you're gonna you know just put it right at the at the throat um, less turns, um, or you, you know, if you're running it all the way up the body, I typically am going to strip one side and that's, like I said, just trying to keep it as sparse as possible. The materials typically move better in the water when they're not all piled and crammed in there too. So, I mean, having them loose and flowy, uh, just definitely helps. All right, perfect. And we talked about the tubes a little bit. So you're just kind of really getting going on the tube flies. I mean, do you think that you're going to get to a point where it, maybe it's uh, too much of a challenge, not quite the good feel you want, or, or how's that look? You know, looking for. And do you maybe see yourself going all tubes? You know, um, I love hooks, and I just tied uh, last night. I tied a, a Glasso Black Heron on a McNeese number one hook, and sometimes, I mean, you know. If it wasn't for me, if I'm not tying these for me, because I'm certainly 
you know, fish don't have an appreciation for these flies like I do, I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, I'm tying these for me. And if that's what I like and that's what I'm going to fish, then that's what I'm going to fish. But some of these flies, they just look good on hooks, and there's no way around that. So if I've got a hook to tie it on and it's going to look good on that, sometimes I'm just going to do that. But, yeah, I mean, I really do see most of my, you know, fishing flies going to tubes. I mean, it just makes more sense. It's better for the fish, smaller hook. It's better for your, you know, fish-to-hand ratio. I think, you know, especially nowadays with the few amount of fish that we really have, it's just something I think about all the time, you know? Yep. I hear you. Nice. Yeah. No, I mean, that's obviously we're, we're in a, uh, you know, especially for summer steelhead, definitely things have been, uh, been rough the last couple of years. Um, but it sounds like you do some other stuff. So you're, you're doing some cutthroat fishing and how much of the time, uh, and you're tying, I'm like, are you fishing any of these like smaller spade D stuff for all those other species? Uh, one of my favorite, uh, sea run cutthroat flies to, to fish with is, uh, little orange, I mean, tiny little orange polar shrimp. I mean, so yeah, I, I do, I convert these flies down to, you know, cause I mean, it's what I like to tie. And so that, that feeds the passion just as much as the fish do. So, and I think it's just cool to be able to connect with fish on a pattern that you're, that you really like. So, mm-hmm. So is that, uh, and when you did, were you fishing for steelhead or what were you doing at your last trip out there on the coast? Uh, yeah. Uh, Jason and I were out there we, uh, were, we were, we were swinging flies. Uh, most of the time we were, we were gear fishing too. And some of the water that we couldn't, couldn't cover as far as, uh, it's what, not, not all of it's swing water. Right. So we, yeah. we gear fish. Uh, but yeah, we were definitely steelhead fishing, caught two fish and yep. kept a hatchery and just go. smoked it up last night. All right. It tastes good. There you go. There you go. That's, that's it. That's what it's all about. Nice. Uh, okay. Well, well this is good. I think I got a, a couple more. I want to, I want to go back to some of your other flies here as we start to take it out of here. And uh, again, you, I mean, when did you start? If you go back to the start of your feed, when did your, uh, why did the Instagram thing start? You know, why did you get on the Instagram posting your flies? Man, I, I was on, like I was on Facebook for a while. Um, I played music uh, in a band for a while. And I did that for the band type of thing. And then that kind of just went away. So I, I just kind of went, got away from social media altogether. And then I don't know, somebody pulled me back in and then I found fly tying stuff and I was like, Oh, this is cool. And yeah, that was on Facebook. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, somebody told me about Instagram and told me I should be on there so i checked it out and i don't know i don't know how it happened I, i'm sure i asked one of my my kids to help me uh, set up an account or something so i just like sharing i just like sharing my passion sharing my flies and and helping other people out because i mean it's paying it forward right i mean i didn't get to be tying you know what i'm tying because nobody helped me out and it's you know so i just like paying that forward yep yeah, there's been a lot of people. I mean, along the way, you mentioned Jason, and Jason talked about some of his influences. And actually, we just had a uh, oh, I had a second John Shuey episode uh, interview recently. It was a really good oh, one. Oh, cool. We, yeah, it was fun. You should definitely check that one out. We, um, I'll be looking forward to that one. Yeah, yeah, we dug into it. was really cool because we started just talking about stuff. And then we got into, uh, I, I don't remember everything, but you know, there's been changes the last couple of years, right? The magazine, as you know, and he just he just came out with a new book too, fifty uh, the great or whatever, fifty steelhead flies. It talks a lot about actually it was fifty flies, yeah. and their histories, yeah. So that's that's out. But um, uh, I'm also looking now. I'm bet this is interesting to me because I'm looking at a drift boat, a blue drift boat, and uh, back away, <laughs> a ways back, and I'm we just had a whole season on drift boats, and I'm always loving uh, getting a little feedback here. So. You know, back in July 2020, what, what's this? Is this your boat? Is this a uh, is this a wood boat? Um, it's actually a fiberglass boat. I bought oh, that is. from a buddy, uh, John Wells, up in he's he's up in uh, Skagit County, and uh, I took that down the Green River uh, and completely destroyed that boat. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So I, I. Uh, you mean you dumped it or just banged it? Oh, I banged it up hard. Um, so I, I brought it home, took it, 
turned it upside down and completely redid it. And I haven't taken it down a river since actually, yeah. but it's been out and on the lake and fishing for trout out there with my daughter. So, Oh, wow. What kind of boat is that? Um, you know what? Oh, shoot. It is a, is it an old boat that's been rebuilt? It's older. It's a, it's an orphaned boat. I can't remember. It's got the sticker on the front yeah. of it. I can't, uh, yeah, no, I'm looking at it. No, it's hard. I can't zoom in on it, but yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll try to track down. Uh, it's an Oregon brand that is no oh, longer is. around. I know that. Oh, wow. So, wow but yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a tiny little boat. It's 12 foot. Yep. Two people is a crowd in that thing, but, uh, <laughs> what was the green that what isn't the green pretty, I mean, it's kind of technical. Uh, yeah, it certainly is. Uh, especially in the summer, which is when I did that. So, um, it was, Oh, you're just banging your way all the way down scraping <laughs> and banging. Well, I had never done it. And I was with a buddy who, he was like, Oh yeah, we can make it down. No problem. And Hey, the two of us is really reaching the, the maximum capacity of this boat. And, uh, this looks pretty skinny and when, you know, it was too late to turn around. Yeah. So, you're already in it. Yeah. So we, uh, we just plunked through and, and, you know, we carried it over some stuff and yeah, we got down, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad when I, when I got it back on the trailer. So I took like a month of redoing the entire bottom of it. So. Have you ever been out and passed up a fishing spot because you didn't have your rod handy? Maybe you didn't even have it in your bag? This rod is a blend of traditional and Tenkara styles that might be called the Holy Grail of Fly Rods. It travels well, fits in almost any bag, and because the rod packs within itself, actually collapses down within it in itself, you don't have to worry about the tip top getting damaged or any of the other parts. And you might be thinking, is this some type of a gimmick? Is this a gimmick? No, not at all. I've been using this thing. I've had this tucked in my backpack on a number of recent trips out, and it's been super handy. Always just having it uh, ready to go, and within seconds, you're out and fishing. It casts great, packs up easily, and is always ready to fish. If I had to choose one word to describe this rod, I would just say efficient, or efficiency would be uh, would be equal. It is a great rod to complete your quiver or uh, can be used as a main rod if you're traveling or just getting into the sport. Rare is an Icelandic word meaning cane or pole. Sounds like the word unique, rare, just like the gear they produce. You can head over to raregear.com to get a peek at this unbelievably unique rod and find out what a rod without guides looks like. That's rare gear. R-E-Y-R. G-E-A-R, Rare Gear. Check it out right now. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to check out Rare Gear. Okay, back to the show. All right, well, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we kind of dug into a little bit here on, uh, you know, it's such a big topic, you know, as far as the spay and deed. It's specific and it's big, you know what I mean? And especially yeah. if you don't do it all the time, you know, trying to get a feel for, you know, if somebody was going to get, what would you tell somebody if, say, if they were going to get in, they wanted to tie some of these cool traditional flies, learn about them, dig into all that. What do you tell somebody? Where do you send them? What's the advice? Um, do it and just practice and, and have fun with it. And honestly, you know, learning the history of where these flies come from, the word spay really gets spent, you know, it's, it, does. it gets thrown out there. So, you know, I, I try to say spay style flies, but I mean, yeah the history behind those flies and why they, why they are what they are is pretty cool. And there's a, there's a group on Facebook, uh, the spay tire. Oh, okay. And also there's another one, the D tire. Um, those are pretty cool and everybody is really helpful. Um, as far as helping people learn not only, you know, about the, the patterns, but also how to tie them and, and techniques. Um, gotcha. I mean, honestly, that's, that's where I got into it and they've been nothing but great to me. So I would definitely recommend those, those two. So that's at the spay tire. And then, and people that are in that group are going there to just, uh, either share some flies or ask questions. I mean, if somebody was new, they, yeah, I guess they go in there, start tying and then go kind of look around, ask some questions about how to tie something and, you know, get some tips there. Yeah, absolutely. And then any books you can get your hands on. I mean, you know, the, Shuey's uh, Spay Fly and D Fly book. Yeah. It's, it's hard to get. You can get oh, it. it. It's expensive. Yep. But it, he is coming out with a new one. Um, I do know that. Uh huh. Oh, so he is. So it, it's like a it's like a second edition. So I guess it's going to be pretty big. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. 
but uh i don't know when it's coming out i just know that it is at some point uh, so that's right who else is it besides shuey because he's kind of obviously the classic steelhead guy any other names like big like shuey style names that are out there that you know influenced you sure um bob viverka you know obviously uh deck hogan marty howard um joe howell all of these guys that have been kind of you know especially the you know sid glasso everybody that's kind of taken that style and made it their own um the space style fly and it's just an evolution and i do you know you can feel one way about it you can feel another way about it i i really like the fact that there's a you know, a resurgence of interest in, in those, uh, styles of patterns. And it leads you down the rabbit hole as far as learning the history. And then what is Spay? And then, you know, it's a river in Scotland and, uh, you know, there's a lot to be learned there. And it's, it's just pretty cool to take that train down the history path and, and see everything. And, and John's book, uh, is, is really good history reference. Um, so if you're into that kind of thing, it's definitely a good read. So, yeah, yeah, he does a good job. He talked a little bit about the history on the episode we did, and some of those Oregon flies. Uh, you know, he noted uh, like Kaufman, right? Kaufman was yep. a big, a big in, uh, influential. Not only, not only in Oregon, but around the country. I was just talking to Phil Roy, who said the same thing. You know, one of his Stillwater books was huge. So, so yeah, that's 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 really cool. Um, well, I guess yeah, we're, we're uh, you know I think we've we've touched on a few things here. I think probably the best thing if somebody wanted to dig more into this is just like we said with Jason, just go to kind of get on there. Either go to these, uh, go to YouTube, right? Uh, now you don't have a YouTube channel, right? But um, I, are there people on YouTube that you follow on YouTube? You know, I I actually picked up a lot of uh, techniques from watching Davy McPhail uh, oh, yeah. videos. Yeah, for sure. Uh huh. But I, I really don't spend a whole lot of time doing on the YouTube stuff. I probably should. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, Davey's a pretty good guy to follow. He's definitely... For sure, yeah. Yeah. Right on. Okay, well, I'm just searching through, seeing if I missed any. You've got, I don't know how many how many patterns, and now I'm looking at this cool wood um, display. But what is your plan? You know, what is your plan for your Instagram? I mean, and just in the flight tying. I mean, do you have any... You know, from here on out, are you going to keep posting as time allows, or what are you going to be doing there? I mean, yeah, that's the plan. I mean, I I enjoy tying flies for steelhead, and that's just kind of what I like to do. It's I, I don't have any real plans. I I enjoy uh, you know, if we ever get back to it, I love the Albany fly tying show. Hopefully, we get to do that again here, and maybe maybe in twenty twenty three. I think is what they're now talking about. So yeah, yeah, that's it. But yeah, I mean, like I said, it's just a, a good community to be a part of, and I don't see that changing for me anytime soon. So, yeah, that's a, it's a good, it's a small in the flight time community. Does it seem like it's a pretty, uh, well, not even flight time because you're in these Spay and D even narrow. Does it seem like you know everybody, uh, everybody out there? No, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't know everybody at all. But yeah, uh, always meeting new people, and I love that. Uh, you know, just being able to geek out with people who have the same interest you know it's pretty cool that is cool well i'm curious just on a random tangent so you have the fly tying in fishing and i know you have uh, your kids i'm sure are a big priority for you what else gets you fired up these days other than you know what are you excited about you know anything else that's like non fly fishing or fly tying related you know i actually just bought my first dslr oh wow so uh, i'm kind of getting into the you know taking pictures of nature and stuff like that oh, I, yeah. I ride uh, mountain bikes and so i like going out into nature and uh-huh taking pictures i'm not there very good go. at it yet but <laughs> <laughs> like i said well you take the photo i mean the photos on instagram now what are is that just a cell phone are those are all cell phone shots you know i did start taking them uh with my with my new camera and it's so weird how you know one hobby leads to another right like mm-hmm. so fly tying leads to collecting, you know, hooks or, or, you know, materials. And, and then, well, if you're going to share these on Facebook and Instagram, well, then you should probably not take crappy pictures. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. so then you start going down the photography hole and it's just, you know, just one thing leads to another. And then, you know, I, and I, I do like that. I mean, it keeps things interesting, you know, I'm always learning. So, yeah. 
so those recent pictures, so something you posted last week on Instagram, that is from a, a cell phone or from your new camera? Yeah, any of the more recent recent photos that have a fly on the, it's like an old wood desk that I have. Mm-hmm. If they look pretty clear, that's probably the DSLR. Oh, okay. So there you go. So. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, the wood desk. So that's all the, that's the, uh, the DSLR. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's led me down so many different paths. It's just fun to see where it goes. Yeah, that's right. And, and where do you where do you think it? I mean, is this gonna go? It sounds like you're not ever gonna tie, uh, you know, production or get into like the business side. This is just surely, uh, you know, solely a, yeah, just like you said, it's a release, release your energy and uh, kind of relaxation meditation. It is, and I, and I do like you know, tying flies and sharing flies with friends as you know. But as soon as someone says, "Hey, can I have?" I want 12 of this. Uh, yeah. I don't want to tie 12 of that. So no. <laughs> never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I, I did try to, I did try to, you know, dabble in maybe selling flies for a little while just to maybe help make the, you know, the hobby pay for itself a little bit. But I just realized that that's not really what I want to do with it. So no, exactly. Well, and remind before we get out here, you, you said mountain bike. I'm curious now. What, what What's your bike? Um, I've got a, it's a Kona. It's an older Kona. It's like a uh-huh. 2011 Tanuki Deluxe. Uh-huh. So it's a like a full suspension. Yeah, it's full suspension. Um, yep. It's more of like a all mountain bike. It's not like a downhill bike. Oh, gotcha. It's not really great at anything, but it. Uh, yeah, it does it all. Yeah, exactly. It does it all right. You can lock out the shocks, so you can get it making a hard tail and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, wait, is Kona K? How do you spell that? K O N A. Yeah, Kayla, yeah, Kona. Okay. Right on. Uh, all right, Joel. Well, I think uh, this has been fun kind of digging into it. I've been seeing you out there, and I know, Jason, you know, we've been talking a little bit over the time, and I've been watching some of your your stuff you've been doing out there. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll definitely keep up with you and and keep sharing. Uh, keep sharing. Who else on Instagram out there? Are there a bunch of people doing the kind of similar like you and Jason are doing on, on the specific like Spay and D stuff? Man, I'm seeing more and more uh, all the time, and I, I don't know everybody's names, especially with you know the Instagram handles, you know. Oh right. But some of the guys that I, you know, John Wells, the guy that I bought the boat from, he's a woodworking artist, and he dyes uh, a lot of stuff. I actually started dyeing stuff, just asking him questions because I couldn't get a, a few of the colors that I wanted, and. Mm-hmm. So that's another rabbit hole, right? So as, as far as, uh, oh, dye these feathers to make you, you know, you can take it as far as you want, as far as dye feathers, put them on a hook that you made, you know, that kind of stuff. But Right, right. You're not into the dyeing yet. That's not quite, is that the next thing you might get into? Oh, I, I dye, I used to dye quite a bit, but oh. I don't, I don't anymore. Um, I have, well, I mean, I do just not as much, not as often. So gotcha. But that's, you know, a whole nother thing. It's just got yeah. a <laughs> big pile of dyes. And, it's another rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. it's another rabbit hole. Um, Sean Reese, uh, feather collector uh, on Instagram, is also one of my buddies, and he's really good at dyeing. So I always take a bunch of, you know, information from him Yeah, and uh, run with that. Perfect. All right, Joel, well, I'll let you get out of here, and we'll send everybody to uh, Joel uh, underscore Hill underscore on Instagram uh, if they want to connect with you. And, uh, yeah, thanks for taking the time to put this together and learn a little bit about what you do. And uh, now we got a better perspective. And, yeah, I guess if we want to get some uh, education or I guess some ideas, right, that, that's where it comes back. Because none of your stuff is necessarily, like, you're not tying exact matches, right? Is that kind of your style? You, you'll just kind of do variations of things? Yeah, I do variations of things, and it's it's for a couple different reasons. You know, either I don't have whatever material uh, is required for the pattern, or maybe I just like it in a different color. Um, there's just, you know, most of the time I, I'm not trying to stick to the pattern to a T. Mm. I'll typically change at least one thing or another. Or another. At what point does it become when you're you have a fly that's a you know the standard whatever fly? You can see how all the materials, and then you're tweaking it, and it now it's a variation. At what point does it not become a variation and just becomes your own a, a new fly that you just created and gave it a name? Yeah, I don't know. I, re- I really don't know. I think that that's probably just pure speculation. Mm-hmm. 
I typically, you know, if I had something in mind while I was tying it, and even if it changes to the point where it's maybe not even recognizable, I'll still just say, well, this is, you know, whatever, a variation of, of this type of thing, you know? Yeah. You usually just say variation. Yeah. What's your, give a shout out to your local, I'm not sure, you said Tacoma. Do you have a local fly shop uh, nearby? Yeah, absolutely. Puget Sound Fly Co. in Tacoma. Uh, they're my go-to anytime I can get something from those guys. They've really helped me out Perfect. with everything. Uh, if I can't get it from them, then I typically go to Waters West or yep. Gig Harbor. Fly Shop always has some stuff. Yeah, perfect. All right, Joel. Well, thanks again. And uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch with you and keep following you out there and, and keep up the good work. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all links and everything else we covered to date, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 297. 297. You can support uh, a local fly shop by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash fly shop. Fly shop to support the local fly shop and get some great gear right now. That is pretty much all I have for you today. I'm not going to dig into it any longer. I'm going to let you get on to the next episode. And I think the next one we have coming uh, Tuesday is a deep dive into some history, some history on the products and fly fishing. It's pretty cool. We've dug into a few new products today that are actually, um, I'm not even sure if any of these products, like for example, the one on from Rare Gear, if that has ever been out there, I think. Uh, the collapsible rod has, but uh, this is definitely a new take. So um, it's pretty cool. So Tuesday, check it out. We got a good history on some of the people behind some of the innovations in fly fishing. So I think that makes a lot of sense uh, when we talk about some of the stuff we dug in uh, today. So uh, so anyways, I'm gonna let you get back to it and check out that episode if it's uh, or subscribe if you want to uh, get updated when that episode goes live. All right, that's a wrap. Thank you for hanging in there, and I want to thank you for supporting the show. Looking forward to seeing you online or maybe on the water. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.